My name is Kim Burney. I'm the current president of the Association for Glycogen Storage Disease, or AGSD. At AGSD, we're committed to the identification, treatment, and cure of glycogen storage disease. We do this through programs of education, advocacy, research, and other patient services. To assist with our mission, it's very important for us to grow and share best practices and key findings, along with other organizations in the rare disease field and community, and that have similar goals. One of these alliances has been with the APBD. Through our collaboration with the APBD and with the AGSD Scientific Advisory Board, we've been able to complete the current glycogen storage disease type four guidelines. These guidelines will provide standardized medical guidance to individuals and families worldwide. Today, I've been asked to introduce Rebecca Koch. Rebecca has just done a phenomenal job writing, coordinating, and finalizing the type four guidelines with the multinational stakeholders along with AGSD. It's really been a pleasure working with Rebecca and I feel honored to be able to introduce her today. Rebecca is a clinical and translational research in the Division of Medical Genetics at Duke University Medical Center. She received her bachelor's in dietetics and her PhD in nutritional services, and she is a registered dietitian. She works on Dr. Priya Kishnani's research team, where her research focuses on better defining the disease progression, pathophysiology, and factors related to treatments and outcomes related to inherited metabolic disorders including glycogen storage disease and others. Looks like the right screen. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, so yes, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Kim, uh, for the nice introduction. So I won't spend too much on an intro because I wanna get to our panel discussion and introduce our wonderful panel members who are here today. Um, but just as a reminder, so I'm the organizer for these guidelines um, and it's really been my absolute pleasure um, working with this wonderful group of people um, to really get these guidelines for both our children and our adults uh, with glycogen like, storage disease type four and adult polyp standby disease. So I'm sorry if you've already listened to me talk earlier, but I'm just doing my visual one more time. Um, and so just as a reminder, uh, the reason why we say all these words like glycogen storage disease is because adult polyglucosamine disease or APPD is a glycogen storage disease. So it means uh, glycogen storage disease at large means you cannot create or use glycogen in the way that you should be able to. So there are several types, and in particular, what we're talking about today is glycogen storage disease type four. So this type four affects children um, in a variety of ways, which could be in the liver or um, the muscle, but it also affects our adults. And that is why we're here today talking about adult polyxan body disease. So the overview of this guideline and why we have this practice tool um, within the medical community is we want to have a practical resource tool for both our clinicians and the patients that can address the diagnosis and management of glycogen storage disease type 4 and APBD. And so we do this through having multiple conversations and um, ultimately putting it in a written form uh, where we highlight what we call the best practices. So what we would recommend at large for this community and also for managing it and you know, developing therapies and how we're gonna implement those. So coming to consensus, meaning we all are in agreement um, at, for this. So the primary audience for this, meaning who we're, who we're intending to get this to is our clinicians, uh, because what we really hope for throughout this is that this tool can be used by a person who is not familiar with APBD, which I don't need to tell this community. I'm sure your local physician has never heard of APBD up until um, you, know, you went to them. Uh, so that's our goal. We don't want our patients, children or adults, having to travel to these expert centers. You know, of course, it's important that they go for, you know, follow-up, but for their routine care, we don't want you doing that. We want you to have this ability to go to your local care provider and still get the best care possible. And so secondarily, we hope that this guideline can be used by the community at large. So, you know, whether that's schools, whether that's I can't think of another example off the top of my head, but schools, anything of that sort, social work, um, you know, people who, again, have not heard of this diagnosis, but want to be able to give it something that tells them what this is, and again, how can we manage it? And of course, for our researchers as well, we want them to be able to understand this disease 
vary all the intricacies of it so that way we can better make uh, therapies and treatments accordingly. So this is not a new um, idea. Um, guidelines have been written for a variety of diseases, including other glycogen storage diseases or GSDs. So they were uh, published for type one, uh, type three, type six and nine to confuse even more with Roman numerals, um, as well as last, a couple months ago, uh, GSD type five and seven. So again, ours is just the next one um, that's specifically focusing on glycogen storage disease type four, including our adult form. And so this is involving 19 experts from across the US. This is a caveat that, you know, this is a US-based um, group and there are for a variety of reasons for that, but we hope that the expertise and the consensus in this, that this guideline can be used from, you know, internationally across the globe. Um, we feel that the, the consensus would still be the same regardless of where, uh, where the patient is. And so there's a variety of experts on this, uh, on this consensus panel um, and they're the, the uh, areas of expertise are listed there, but here's a picture um, that just again shows one of our virtual discussions um, that we were able to have. And so we hope to publish this guideline or submit it for publication um, in fall, uh, later fall. So hopefully having it out um, by the end of 2022, if not early 2023. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our other panel members. So Dr. Ariana Smith is a professor of urology at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the director of pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. She's also the chief of urology at Pennsylvania Hospital. She contributes to our GSD-4 APD guideline as our expert urologist. Dr. Jennifer, or Jennifer sorry, Orthman Murphy is a assistant professor of neurology, co-director of the Age Span Fellowship in MS Neuroinflammatory Disorders at the University of Pennsylvania. And she's also faculty at the Mahoney Institute for Neurosciences. And she has joined this guideline to expand on her expertise in neuroinflammation. And Dr. Rafi Schiffman uh, is a renowned expert on neurometabolic diseases, including APPD. He's a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Texas Christian University and the clinical professor or a clinical professor at Texas A&M University Medical School College of Medicine. He's also the senior vice president for clinical research at 4D Molecular Therapeutics, and he has extensive experience with APBD and is a wonderful asset to our guideline. Uh, so with that, I will stop sharing and I will ask you all. So I know Rob, Dr. Schiffman, I think, was having some trouble entering uh, the room, so I'll check my email uh, to be on board for him. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Smith and Dr. Orson Murphy for being here. Um, for the next 30 minutes or so, I just want to talk to you more about some questions, um, you know, expand on your experience with this guideline, um, and then hopefully we can uh, maybe hear from some patients as well. Uh, so to start off, just with one easy question, I guess, um, can you walk us through how each of you have taken either your experience or patient care to write your respective section or sections in the guideline? So I'll start with you, Dr. Smith, if that's okay. Sure, thank you. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today and it's been quite a pleasure to be a part of this group and to be involved in writing the guidelines. I think it's always tricky when um, the science is evolving to really put together a guideline because we don't have a whole plethora of patient experiences and clinical trials to use to put together that information. So we needed to do um, a lot of things and what I did for, for my part in this is I listened to the patients that I do have who have this condition, who've taught me so much about why um, it's challenging, specifically with respect to the bladder. Um, and then of course, dove into the literature that is available um, that does you know, really try to um, bring together as many patient reports and experiences as possible to put into the literature what we do know. And taking those together and drawing upon my previous experience with other conditions that affect bladder function um, neurologically, like for example, with um, multiple sclerosis, um, I was able to draw on that knowledge to really help develop this portion of the guideline. I think we still have a ton to learn and I'm excited to see how this uh, blossoms with time, uh, but that was the approach that I took. Dr. Orphan Murphy, anything to add? Sure. Um, thanks for having me here. Um, and it's great to see you, Dr. Smith, um, and for taking my referrals. It's been wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I, my section is actually more, a little bit more of the basic science about um, how, how this disease affects the brain. And in neurology, we don't have 
um, any medication that fixes the brain and the spinal cord. It just doesn't exist. It's, it's our unmet need that we need to figure out. And it's something that I study in the lab. And I got into it by um, studying in MS, how you can remyelinate the brain. And so my, my approach for writing this section of the guidelines is to say, well, what's similar and what's different? And because the same area of the brain is affected, it's a white matter disorder. I think a lot of people have mentioned that they, they had this uh, white matter lesions on MRI. Well, what does that mean? What symptoms does that give you? Which cells are involved? And I think the clues that are telling us is that um, uh, you, you, know, you, need, you need a lot of energy to make your brain work. And when it's not working efficiently, you feel fatigued. And I, I'll show you, I made a couple of slides to kind of explain why that has to be true. Um, and to kind of get get into the nitty gritty, but in this case, um, what I think what, what I think I can offer with these guidelines is to say that we actually know from a lot of different other types of disorders what these cells are doing, but actually understanding how it happens in adult polyglucose and body disease will not only explain for this disease how we can fix it and intervene, but actually might help explain how all the other disorders might be dependent on this process, which is very important and actually sort of opens the picture for other funding sources, to be honest, to, to dive in and understand um, uh, how the brain needs to work efficiently over life. Yeah, no, that was a great segue. If you want to pull that up, um, the one thing I was going to share that Dr. Smith, you made me think of is um, including the patient voice in this as well. So I know you hinted that you, or not hinted, you said uh, that you, you know, interviewed with your patients and you're taking in your experience with them as well um, and putting that into this guideline and helping you form it. Um, but also what we've done on the side is select groups, mostly me and a couple other people, um, have been talking with the patients themselves as well, both our children and our adults. Um, you know, and patient representatives if um, to give a voice to the patients as well, to hear about again, what their biggest burdens in care have been and what they would hope to get out of this guideline. Um, so Dr. Orthan Murphy, you can share yours or if it's not letting you to, I can share it for you. Let me know. Perfect. Okay, so this is actually a slide that I made to present to people uh, to patients with multiple sclerosis. Um, so I just took that title away because it's the basic same building blocks that, that uh, we start with. Um, and so I just wanted to show you because a lot of people have mentioned the words neuroinflammation, including yesterday at the conference, and it's actually quite complicated what that means. And so um, the brain, which is here on the right side, um, is separated from the blood and you have lots of blood vessels in your, in your brain to provide nutrients and take out all the garbage. Um, but it's sort of protected by this blood brain barrier. So in the blood, you have immune cells like B and T cells, which are lymphocytes and macrophages, which chew stuff up. And in the brain, you have neurons. Everybody knows about neurons, but um, because I'm very biased, I am a glial biologist. So I'm going to tell you about all the other cells, which are 50% of the, the, the other 50% of the brain. So oligodendrocytes are these incredible cells that form um, all these specialized processes along an axon. They're called myelin sheaths. And they actually reorganize the, the axon, which is this long part of the neuron, which sends a signal from one end to the other. And the myelin helps it work more efficiently. These cells called OPCs, these are oligodendrocyte precursor cells. They are this endogenous, meaning they, uh, the source that's in your brain to make new oligodendrocytes, and they are there for your whole life, all the way into old age. And they can always be available to make a new oligodendrocyte, and in fact, are the most proliferative cell of the brain. And then you have astrocytes, and I have them pictured here as clouds, because they actually fill in all the space. You may see many cartoons of um, what cells in the brain look like. And they're always you know, very far apart from each other. But in this case, it's actually um, an astrocyte interacts with everybody. It interacts with blood vessels at the blood brain barrier. It interacts with other astrocytes. It interacts with oligodendrocytes and neurons. And it knows everything that's going on. And in fact, it's the astrocyte that's pulling in glucose or sugar from the blood, storing it as glycogen, and then um, altering the glycogen to be sources like lactate and pyruvate to help the oligodendrocyte and the neuron work properly. And so it's astrocytes probably where all the action is at in APBD. There's also these innate immune cells that are in the brain called microglia. They're very similar to the macrophages that are in the blood. And their job is to constantly survey the environment to make sure everything's okay. When there is damage, like loss of oligodendrocytes, the astrocytes get mad. And they, I have them pictured here as stars or kind of angry stars because that's sort of how they're classically described in pathology. And the microglia become little Pac-Man that eat stuff up and clear out the damage. 
and sometimes you lose neurons. And th that this represents the damage that you can see in this compartmentalized brain injury where it's only happening inside the brain. And this sort of um, represents something similar that's happening in MS, except the difference is the blood-brain barrier breaks down, lets in these B and T cells, and that's what causes the damage in the first place. And so I just wanna give you an idea of why you get so tired without when you lose myelin. So in this little figure, I'm gonna show you current conducting down an axon. These little dots, white dots are spaces between myelin sheaths. And when I play this video, it's going to show you these little blips of current going from the left to the right. So that's basically a neuron sending a signal down an axon. So you can see each blip is, is how uh, it represents essentially sodium and potassium channels changing flow, but the signal is going from left to right. And myelin makes it very efficient. On the right, you see this area that's missing that myelin sheath right here in the middle. So now, now you can see what happens to that current signal as it goes down. And the reason I'm showing this to you is because you're now gonna watch this like little blippy signal go down that area that corresponds to the patch. And now look how long it takes. And it's because that axon or that neuron has to work so much harder to get that signal to pass from one end to the other. And so you can imagine that when damage has happened to these cells that they have to work so much harder. And this is exhausting for the cell. And overall, when you're trying to do tasks, it's exhausting. And so our job is to figure out as many possible ways to, to help that axon work. And there are actually many potential ways to intervene, even if we don't have a disease modifying medication. And a lot of that is based on what we know from care people, uh, of what happens with um, in, in MS. I'll stop sharing there. Perfect. So if I were to take that, I guess, because I'm not a neuroinflammation expert, I think we've all realized that by now, um, and just kind of translate why it's so important that we have that for a guideline is one, it, like you're saying, it doesn't have to necessarily be specific to APBD. Um, it could be something that is going on in multiple diseases, but again, at the end of the day, we're still having the same problems, right? So mm -hmm. we want to be able to manage it. Um, and so part of this is if you were to go to a or again, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I were to take this guideline and go to a person who is maybe not familiar as much with MS or not as familiar with APD, which is probably the large group of neurologists, um, but they can still read this and be able to understand what would be best for that patient, especially at local care. Um, exactly. So I think that was great. I love that cartoon. <laughs> it's so helpful for me to understand as well. Um, so that leads me to my next question. So how do you foresee these guidelines being used in your patient care um, and even as your own, in your own practice? So from both you know, the physician side and the, the patient side. So Dr. Smith, I'll start with you. Yeah, so I mean, I think in the field of urology, we might be a little bit behind some of the other, you know, fancier specialties like neurology. I certainly don't have slides that look as cool as those, although I do have one if we have a minute that I'd love to pull up in contrast to what was just shown, just for fun. Um, but I think the way that this type of guideline really helps um, providers and patients alike is it really makes the, the knowledge uh, accessible. And it allows patients who are seeking care across the country and the world access to what you know, experts put together after hours and hours of thinking about it. I mean, we all dove in, we put, you know, our heart and souls into trying to figure out what would be an optimal plan, an optimal strategy, and then to try to impart that knowledge onto other people in, in a minute it is difficult, but by putting a guideline together like that, it's right at people's fingertips. And it's really something that patients can go into their appointments with equipped and say, hey, listen, look, this is what I found. What do you think of this? And it's something if a provider sees a patient on their schedule and they're like, oh my God, what is APBD, they, they now can do a quick search and they can find these things. So part of our job as, as leaders is really to make sure that we are um, allowing our knowledge to be accessible to, to everyone. Anything to add, Dr. Orkman-Murphy? Uh, that was a great answer, and I completely agree. Um, I, I think um, I, I can just add in, um, similar to what I said this morning in the scientific session, is that it, it provides the framework um, for when, um, even before I've necessarily diagnosed someone, um, to say, what are all the things that I need to know about someone to, one, make the diagnosis, 
And then what are all the things that I need to add in that I missed because now I know what it is and this is specific to APBD and who is the team that needs to be a part of this. And it's gonna be many, many people and we all have to work together with some level of trust that even though there's, there's discomfort that people have when they haven't heard of a disorder to have this constant encouragement that you know, if there's damage in the spinal cord, if there's damage in the white matter, we actually know what to do symptomatically. We might not know with any individual person which exact part of it's gonna work for one person, but we know what to try. And then as time, once we have these guidelines in place, we can say, well, now we have these natural history studies and everything. Maybe it's actually, um, and people reporting their responses to these medications, we can say, well, maybe this medication is actually not great in this disorder because this, but because we've sort of collected all this information. And then, you know, I love, um, in some cases, not everybody's going to be able to see someone, uh, a neurologist like me who's seen it before, um, but I'm, I could work with a local neurologist um, just to, you know, provide guidance on some of those pieces, even provide the guidelines, remind people that the guidelines are out there sort of thing. Oh, 100%. I echo that. And one thing you made me think of, I, I think I said this to the scientific part, but um, from a patient perspective too, if you're ever going for an insurance company approval for something um, like an assistive device and the insurance company doesn't know what APBD is or they don't understand why someone would need this assistive device um, or again, insert whatever uh, you're trying to get approval for, having a document that a provider can actually provide to that insurance company and it lays out why it's so important that this patient has this and, um, you know, this is why and it's it's absolutely necessary for their care, you'd be surprised that that's all it takes for an insurance company to do a check mark and approve something. So it's a sad world we live in, but um, it's true. So it's it's helpful to have a, you know, a published document. Um, and there was a question, um, how can a patient expect to use these guidelines once published? And when is the publication time? So uh, we're aiming, we're on time to uh, publish these guidelines or ask for publication um, permission uh, from a journal in fall of 2022, so this fall. Um, and so we hope that they'll be published by the end of this year, if not early 2023. And that will be what we call open access, meaning it doesn't cost any money to access this document. Um, and then, you know, once it's published, of course, the foundation and all of our other organizations, we're gonna ask them to push it out um, to everyone so you'll have access. And I'm sure the APB Research Foundation will be uh, doing some sort of press release or some sort of email out uh, with that. Uh, but thank you, Dr. Schiff, and I see you're here. I'm sorry if the link wasn't working earlier. Um, but I'll just move on to my next question. Or yeah, hi, yeah, Dr. Schiff. I, I, I really, I, I apologize. I, I, uh, I, um, I got confused in the time. No it? problem. <laughs> no problem. No, we're happy to have you. <laughs> I apologize, but I know that you guys are amazing. <laughs> and probably don't need me. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> That's not true. Um, but no, I guess, Dr. Schiffman, from your perspective, um, I know you've seen quite a lot of APD patients. Um, and so with this guideline, do you, how do you picture it being used um, either in practice or by the patients themselves, given that you've seen so many? Do you feel like this would be a useful tool for them to have in their back pocket? Yeah, I know. I, I, I think that the, the would be useful. Um, uh, it's such a rare disease on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, uh, or in association, uh, physicians, uh, uh, you know, often overlook it. So the main thing is to uh, to make them to to uh, to make the correct uh, diagnosis. Um, but even after diagnosis. Um, it's uh, really, if I have to pick a certain thing, is the is for physicians to be really careful when they uh, make any predictions in progression. Uh, if I have to pick one thing, uh, that would be it, uh, because the heterogeneity of progression uh, is immense, and uh, we are, um, you know, and, and the vast majority of us, including myself, you know, are not smart enough to predict in any uh, given individual, okay? So um, so these uh, guidelines, I hope will also help uh, uh, to be wise and careful um, and uh, <clears throat> in making um, any predictions. Um, the treatment, as you know, is symptomatic right now, but I really hope uh, this is, should be an eminently treatable and preventable disorder. It's immensely frustration, uh, frustrating that we are still here 
uh, and we don't have that. Uh, I'm speaking about uh, specifically APPD, of course, but you know. So these are some of the uh, comments I would make. Yeah, no, I, I feel like you captured that perfectly, especially about the progression. Um, so I know we've been cautious in stating that as well with the guideline. Um, I was just looking at the chat here. Um, do any of these treatments work for people with Lafora disease? So one, I would have to defer um, to our Lafora disease expert, or even uh, Dr. Benazian. Um, But I think that's a conversation that, or I, I know we've had it with the foundation of how we can at least make remarks in the guideline that this there are you know parts that could be um, applicable. But I think given that Lafora, the, the population is so different, I think there's going to be some caveats that are more specific to an adult population um, versus the Lafora, which tends to be in children. Um, and then Harriet asks, will the guide deal with pressure and wound prevention? Specialized beds are very important preventative tools and are very expensive. Insurance companies are <laughs> like to load to approve before the first wound occurs. Um, yes, so we are having a section on um, special considerations and kind of these other medical care considerations, including <laughs> pressure wound prevention, um, because even from a nutrition perspective, I know that's hugely important. Um, and we want to prevent it before it happens. So yes, and then especially for specialized beds, you know, that's also what we're hoping is if we can do these keywords in the guideline and point out why it's so important uh, from a scientific perspective to prevent this, um, we hope that even again, just giving this guideline to the insurance companies can remind them that, you know, it's this specific disease, this is why we need it. Um, but is there anything else that any of the panel members wanted to add to that? So just, I guess, extra considerations we're trying to include um, at least in your experience, that maybe patients haven't had approved or that you think this guideline could be helpful for. I just wanted to wrap it up with our panel of um, if there was anything that you uh, would wish that our patients, um, either in your care, if there was anything that you would hope that they would use this guideline for. So whether, I guess, giving them the power. So if you would want them to provide this to their provider or kind of some steps that you think this could be useful for them. So whether, again, that's giving it to their provider sharing it with their family, I guess, from your experience, what would you want this guideline to be used for their perspective? And I'll just ask Dr. Smith, I saw you were nodding, so I'll just give it to one person. Yeah. Great, thanks. So in the urology section, um, we talk a little bit about options for treatment and ways to address symptoms. And I think it's always tricky because patients are given the diagnosis of a neurogenic bladder, and that means a lot of things. And it means different things to different patients and it means different things to different providers. And there's really this spectrum of symptoms associated with a neurogenic bladder and there's a spectrum of function associated with a neurogenic bladder. And I think what's so important for the patients and the providers to realize is that treatment really has to be individualized. It is really specific to what is going on with that individual, what they're bothered by and what may or may not be a dangerous repercussion if left unaddressed. And I think the guideline can really help steer patients to recognize that there is some differential treatment. It's not a one size fits all like, oh, you see urology, you get this pill and you're good. It's not that at all. It really involves a thoughtful conversation and discussion and just heightening awareness about the variety of symptoms that are possible and the variety of treatments is something I hope this guideline um, will offer patients and providers. Absolutely. No, thank you. That was a great, um, I guess, wrap up to our, our discussion part. So next, I just wanted to open it up to the floor. I say this with a caveat. I will. <laughs> I have a couple of people I just want to hear from first. Um, and then if we have time, I want to open it up. Um, and so the reason for this is really because um, a lot of us, we're not going to see all of you. Um, we want to be able to capture your stories, but also we are realistic that we're all from all over the world. Um, and so there was just a few patients that I first wanted to start off with. And then um, if we have some time, I want to open it up um, to the floor. Um, so I'll start off with Heidi. I know that you had your hand raised. Um, so Heidi, I know you had some words if you could share those with us today. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share um, my experiences because maybe they're not typical. My name is Heidi. I was officially diagnosed with APBD in October 2019, actually at the Undiagnosed Diseases Network at NIH. Although I had symptoms for many years, I experience severe pain all the time now. And through my interactions with others, I understand that not all APBD patients experience this. The pain is in my legs, feet, hip, lower abdomen, perineum, bladder, and perianal area. To further describe this pain, um, 
in the nether regions, perineum, vaginal rectum, it's burning, stabbing, inflamed, and irritated. The pain worsens as the day progresses and it's exacerbated by urine, a full bladder, and a full bowel. I also have stabbing pain in the lower abdomen, just above the pubic bone. The pain in my legs and feet is aching and stabbing combined with numbness in the feet and legs. And you might not think that numbness and pain can coexist, but they can, as probably many of you know. While the pain gets worse as the day progresses, it never goes away. It's difficult to move around and exercise. It makes it difficult to sleep sometimes, and it wakes me up every night, like three times. I've tried several therapies. Transcranial magnetic stimulation, pain. These are therapies for pain. Radio frequency nerve ablation, scrambler, cortisone injections, all have been unsuccessful to date. So I, I just want to implore doctors treating APVD patients, try to treat us holistically and not focus too narrowly on their specific area of expertise. Pain crosses is all these boundaries. I'm looking for treatments that will ease the group of symptoms and maybe even slow it down until the cure is found. And I echo what Sarah said also. So anyway, I, I wanna say I appreciate all this work to improve diagnosis, enhance care and find us treatments and hopefully a cure. Thank you. Well, thank you, Heidi. Um, the next thing I saw was Sandra. Uh, Garner. I'm not sure if Sandra's here. No, I'm right here. I'm right oh, here. Oh, perfect. Okay, sorry. I know my Zoom looks no, no, different. No, that's okay. That's okay, <laughs> Becca. Uh, which question did you want me to answer? Because I'm also uh, coming up on um, the... Yeah, I guess just if you um, if you had anything to share um, about your oh, experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, Dr. Schiffman. It's Sandy Gartner. <laughs> we were part of Dr. Schiffman's... Uh, trial a while ago yeah yes. um but, nice, to see you. nice to see you sir what's that okay okay um i will go as far as you want me to go because i know i'm supposed to just do it again i guess but we didn't have a family neurologist um at the beginning of of our thing um we alan was actually diagnosed 10 years ago this month and the first clue that something wasn't right was alan's diminished eyesight and we went from our local ophthalmologist to a neuro ophthalmologist who did an MRI and saw white matter on his brain. And the doctor then referred him to an MS specialist with no results. She then sent him to Massachusetts Eye and Ear and no one had an answer why he had white matter on his brain or was losing his eyesight. And so by chance, a renowned um, Massachusetts general diagnostician saw his MRI scan. And he ran a number of tests, including um, some biopsies and the final test did show APBD. And would you want me to share the rest of this? Because- Yeah, sure, I guess like if you have 30 seconds more, we can do that. <laughs> um, Alan has, I think that Alan, um, Alan has captured, I think all the symptoms of APBD, which is totally um, unfortunate. Um, he was diagnosed within a year, which made it a little easier. But he now has, in terms of his symptoms, he has uh, an indwelling catheter, he has an ostomy for his bowel movement, his optic nerve atrophy, and he's 90% blind. He has osteomyelitis of the sacral bone. He has wounds on his right heel, lateral right ankle, and ischium, type 2 diabetes. He's unable to move on his own. We use a Hoyer and a wheelchair. He has anxiety and depression, and he has silent aspiration, and he was just fitted with a feeding tube. So we've had a real uh, roller coaster of a ride. And, I, and what I, what I want to say as far as Alan's experience is that the two things that I think a neurologist should really be aware of in, after our experience is that not, there is not always the same presenting symptoms. And I know that sometimes some of the symptoms that come along kind of get lost in the shuffle, you know, and I, th I think the fact that Alan had this eye thing, people were like saying, well, it's got to be the diabetes, or it's got to be this, or it's got to be that. And as it turned out, it was the APBD. 
And um, so that was that was something that I would I would say to the people who who are doing the work. And I'm also the other thing I would say is that don't assume that every patient is going to develop every single symptom either, because my husband was told that the first thing he would lose was his cognition. Just said, you're going to lose your mind. And uh, it made him very made him very upset. He still remembers it 10 years later. And after a decade, his memory is just beginning to be affected. So I don't think I don't think we can put APBD people in this kind of like blanket form. Is what I'm saying. And I do so appreciate being part of the Adult Polyglucose and Body Disease Foundation, and I fall in love with Emil Weiss. And I just want you to know that. <laughs> you, oh, you, thank you for sharing. <laughs> and I know you provided your um, your email, so I'm definitely going to take you up on that to hear uh, to get this because I, I was taking notes, but I, I did them I think too slow. So <laughs> I want to make sure we capture that. Um, so there's just one more person um, that I wanted to hear uh, from Sarah Williams. Um, and Sarah, I hate to pick you off on time, but if, uh, just one more minute, because I know we have to move on to the next session, but we want to hear from you if you're here. Oh, Sarah, you're muted. I think I found you. Yes. Sorry, uh, you don't really need to hear any more from me, I think. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I was going to bring up the vision, but um, since that was just talking well, about Well, selfishly, it. I think that was a big thing that we've had discussions as as a discussion, like as a panel um, and with the other co-authors. So if there was anything that you could allude to with the vision, that's been a huge thing that we don't see necessarily in the literature, but we have hear, heard anecdotally is um, a complaint. Okay, yeah. Well, my, my, my brother, again, a routine eye exam, and they just noticed mm -hmm. the, the peripheral the peripheral test didn't mm -hmm. work, you know, he, they, they flagged that. And um, he was also noted that he had problems with contrast and he was seeing color casts. Um, and they, again, they referred him to a neurologist and he told him he had MS, um, which wasn't right. Um, I have a few things going on. I have double vision. Um, I have this thing where if I'm looking at stripes or, you know, just lines, they, they move, they, they shimmer. Um, and I've, both my brother and I have seen numerous people um, who just don't know what's, you know, they just say, even, even neuro, optim, op, neuro ophthalmologists just sort of shrug and say, I guess it's part of the disease. Um, what did happen to my brother though, his vision was getting worse and worse anyway. But then he was out for a run and he couldn't really see that there was an obstacle on the path and he fell um, and his vision went, it just went. Um, he did have a concussion, but when he recovered from that, it, it, the vision did not come back. He said it was like someone switched off the light. Um, so who knows, you know, that no one's, he's seen numerous people and no one's been able to explain why that would happen. Maybe it's APBD, maybe it's not, but I just wanted to, to highlight it. No, thank you for that. Um, and I didn't mean to write you. Um, no, that's, it's, I, I really, we do hope to acknowledge the vision part because this has been an anecdotal thing that's come up and we wanna make sure we give, if nothing else, we draw attention to it. Um, so that way it's, it's you know, noticed. Um, so I hate to end our session because I would love to hear all of your stories. So I am in communication with Harriet. So I don't know who's in the session, but I will, I think she's on a cruise, but I will sign, oh, there she is. Um, but I will sign up, um, I'll, I'll get, be in communication with her too. And I, we would love to hear more about any other symptoms that might have not been covered covered um, here. And again, happy to answer any questions about the guidelines at a separate time. So I will pass it back over to whoever is taking over the next, next session. And thank you to all the panelists today.